When is a car of the year not a car of the year? Easy answer. This is always the case when it's not a car of the year. In other words, senior executive geniuses at Wheels magazine have taken the bold and brave decision to drop the C-bomb as a prerequisite for its so-called Car of the Year award henceforth. I might have to take the rest of this video off, dude, because this one is just gonna be too easy. I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars and not cars. Let's not forget those. Cheap. Australia only. Website. Card. Now, if your single overarching reason for existence this month is to bestow upon a conveyance an award called Car of the Year, is it not inherently a problem? Should you decide to give that award to a big boxy all-terrain shitbox with a ladder frame, an antiquated engine, a dud transmission and sundry other deficiencies that make it not a car and therefore this conduct does it not require intrinsically the application of several different laminations of export grade bullshit just to make this proposition seem reasonable because on my world it really really does. I admit that I live in the past in a world where the facts really do matter, and we live in a post-truth era now, obviously, so perhaps it's me who's out of step. Perhaps I should propose some other awards. Subaru WRX might be the front-runner for not a 4x4 of the year. Maybe the Nissan Leaf will walk away with the Summonats burnout competition. <laughs> because we need to be more inclusive there, specifically including cars that will never bag them up. And the past, we should re-engineer that as well. So I propose, as a first step, we should posthumously award the RMS Titanic Aircraft of the Year 1912. Would that not just serve to line everything up and things could start making sense again? It's just a suggestion. Now, a dude you've probably never heard of called Alex Inwood is a judge of Car of the Year and in my estimation, he does try far too hard to be liked. I mean, you're not in a quest for approval, dude. You're just in a war against indifference. Like, come on. Anyway, he said, it feels like a large SUV. <laughs> Designed and built to meet the demands of RC buy. And it doesn't just tick the boxes, it goes above and beyond in virtually every metric. Be that as it may, it's not a car, and one of the metrics in which it is preposterously deficient, Alex, is availability. So in terms of meeting the demands, like, dude, if I am so impossibly G'd up by your bullshit car of the year award that I find myself racing to the nearest Ford dealer whence I jump into the showroom floor and remove my trousers and otherwise lubricate myself for the upcoming acquisition of an Everest Platinum and I get my five grand down and put it on the counter and trust me, doing this in a dealership is the rock solid way to apologise for any kind of conduct that might otherwise seem unacceptable in a place such as that. If I do that, I am not going to take delivery of my Everest for 10 months. Like, this is another case of this award going to a car that you cannot buy in practice. It's 10 months away, dude. Quarter one of 2024 at the earliest. And it, it makes me wonder just how ridiculously out of touch with the car buying public a publication must be to give an award which is supposed to inform consumers about good vehicles and less good vehicles, to give that award to something that is simply not commercially available now. That's a fucking joke. Like, come on. So... Wheels further alleges that Everest is, quote, really well thought out 
Ford has not just copied best practice SUVs, it's established best practice in many areas. Has it really? Has, does this vehicle really drive the automotive sector forward with its incredible innovation? Is that how this works? With its 19-year-old engine, which I propose we henceforth call the Ford Power Slut because it's been used by everyone. This has been in the Ford Territory. That was 19 years ago. Land Rover Discovery, Range Rover Sport has been in Jaguars and Citroens and Peugeots. And I think when you look down at that list, there is a common thread of reliability, is there not? And it's mated to that appalling 10R80 10-speed transmission, co-developed with General Motors, of which 47,000 were recalled as early as 2021 because they could just go into neutral at any time. And let's not forget there are at least three lawsuits which allege life-threatening potential transmission problems in the USA. And if you're interested, you want some bedtime reading, they are Marino versus Ford, Orndorff versus Ford, and O'Connor versus Ford. In fact, according to Knight Law Group in the USA, quote, it's highly questionable that a 10-speed transmission with poor shifting, jerking, lunging, and other problems could allow for safe driving, let alone live up to any of Ford's marketing claims. These do seem to be mutually irreconcilable positions vis-a-vis -vis the design excellence of the new Everest, do they not? Anyway, just saying. According to Wheels, quote, Thai built it may be, but we're the biggest market for this vehicle. The next largest regions in turn being India, Vietnam, Thailand and the Philippines. In other words, Everest is kind of carefully designed to exploit shitholes like Australia in which lax regulators allow filthy vehicles to continue to join us on the roads in an environment where exhaust pollution from vehicles kills more people prematurely than road trauma. This is a medical fact, but let's not let that get in the way of declaring a vehicle to be excellent. Hashtag car of the year. Shit, yeah. Why don't we talk about dynamics here too? Because Wheels is a bit bipolar on the issue of dynamics. Quote, It was clear right from the outset that body-on-frame SUVs and youths arriving on all-terrain tyres would occupy the wooden spoon positions in dynamic tests such as high-speed avoidance and dry braking. And so it proved. So what they're saying is, on bitumen, if you have to swerve to avoid a child or a kangaroo, or if you have to do an emergency stop, you're fucked. And I haven't got a problem with that because it's absolutely true. So Everest basically handles like a bucket of diarrhea on bitumen. And if you've got to swerve around Skippy at 100 kilometres an hour on the highway or swerve around a kid at 50 or 60 in the burbs... That's going to be a bad day, isn't it? But on dirt, dude! <laughs> Quote, wheels alleges. The stability control system is inspired on dirt. Seriously. This vehicle has clearly been built by people with a deep understanding of how it's going to be used in its key market. Mm. What a pity that wheels apparently has absolutely no clue regarding how passenger vehicles are actually deployed in Australia. Most Everests, most Land Cruisers, most Prados, etc., they never go off-road. They're just the family frickin' wagon. But let's say you are that potential dingo piss creakian. That's what you want to do. And you take delivery of your fine new Everest and you take it on a shakedown run from Sydney. Where should we go, dude? We should make it significant because this vehicle is inspired, after all, 
on dirt. So how about we take it out to Birdsville in Queensland. This is a one-way journey of about 2,000 kilometres. So round trip, 4,000 k's, which is roughly Sydney to Perth. That should do, should it not? Here's how that trip breaks down, dude. Sydney to Quilpie in Queensland is about 1,300 k's, and it's all bitumen. Okay, so you're going to sit there at 100 k's an hour for 13 hours, not including fuel and fries and burgers and coffees and things of that nature, but drive time 13 hours at 100 friggin' k's an hour on bitumen where the handling is fundamentally compromised. And then when you get to Quilpy, there'll be 625 k's of dirt, so yay. Your round trip is therefore going to be two-thirds of the time, just a little bit over actually, two-thirds of the time spent in an environment where the handling is not optimised. And that means if Skippy hops out, it could be better. That's just how this works. And that's if you decide to take the bold step of driving from a capital city to a place like Birdsville, FFS. Most people who own an Everest will not be doing that. They'll be driving from the burbs to the station, the school, the shops, and they'll be doing a few odd drives in the country from time to time, annual holidays. Very little of this time will actually be spent on dirt, and statistically none of it will be off-road. And I'm not just pulling this data out of my ass. incidentally. If you go to the survey of motor vehicle use compiled by the Australian Bureau of Statistics and you look at passenger vehicles in Australia, so not light commercials, not trucks, not things of that nature, just passenger vehicles. In our capital cities, we drive 97 billion kilometres every year, which is like 15 return trips to fucking Pluto. And it's not even a planet, so, you know. And other urban areas, so regional cities, things of that nature, another 28 billion kilometres. That's 125 billion kilometres in total of driving in urban areas. Other areas... 31.5 billion. So not a tiny amount, but proportionally pretty small. In fact, the total driving is about 156.5 billion kilometres, of which 80% of that driving is in urban areas. And of the 20% that is other area driving, most of that is on major highways, like the Hume Highway, the Pacific Highway. Etc. Even if you drive right across Australia from Sydney to Perth on the Nullarbor, you'd be flat out finding the bits of dirt road on that drive. Unless you make little side trips, which you are obviously welcome to make, but the vast majority of your driving is going to be on bitumen. If you do a lap of Australia and you find yourself in Darwin and you're going to drive down the Gibb River Road to Derby and then you're going to go down to Broome and then come back the long way via Perth and across the Nullarbor... Sure, the Gibb River Road, there's dirt, but the rest of the drive, dude, it's sealed and you're going to be operating in an environment in which the handling on that car is suboptimal. Doesn't make sense, does it? <sighs> this sweet spot for Aussies, by Aussies, jingoistic rhetoric is unsubstantiated by the fact if you take a vehicle like that on a bitumen road, you are compromising your safety in a critical driving situation. And it is irresponsible, in my view, for wheels not to make a big deal out of that because they seem to think safety is important when they report on it in other areas, right? So four days earlier than the announcement of Everest is our not a car of the year, they wrote a story, in fact, Andy Enright wrote a story called 2023 Ford Everest V6 Sport Long-Term Review. And Andy's a wheel at wheels. And the, if you want to crack the kooky code on long-term review, what it basically means is car company gives the publication a car. Like, here's your free car for six to 12 months. Just have fun and love us, okay? So at that time, he had to know 
what the announcement was. All right. Now, here's what he said in the long term review about the V6 Sport, which is one step down from the Platinum Everest. OK, quote, by the time I took delivery of the Everest, he was having a bit of a bitch about some other staffers getting to it first. OK, a notice had flashed up in the dash signaling that it needed replenishing with Ad Blue within a couple of hundred kilometres or it would throw a hissy fit and refuse to start. OK, so designed for Australians, by Australians, optimised for Australian conditions, the mode in which this vehicle is designed to be used. Let's say you're driving along the Gun Barrel Highway in Central Australia, which is between fuck all and fuck all else, right? It's just nothing. It's, it's not even busted ass cattle scrub. It's just rocks and desert forever. If that notice comes up, you're screwed. Because there's nowhere where you can pick up any ad blue. So how optimised for these outback conditions is this vehicle, honestly, for the big trip? And that's okay if you know, because you can just have a bottle of ad blue in the boot and it can be part of your kit. Yay. But if you don't know, and Ford will never tell you, like on the website, try finding the page that says, hey dude, carry some spare ad blue if you visit the outback, otherwise you're screwed. How is this optimised for outback adventuring? I'm not seeing it. Anyway, in the car of the earpiece, they say, quote, software has been developed by Australians for our conditions. You can feel the difference, especially in the effectiveness of the ABS calibration on gravel. Pro tip, you're not testing the software. You're testing the car, which is the software control and all of the systems, right? So it's, it's really just not the software. It's about the whole thing. This is obviously a distinction that only a technical person would appreciate. But, hey, if you want to sound like you know what you're talking about. <sighs> Enright, on the long-term review, says, One feature that strangely also goes amiss on anything other than the flagship he means the Platinum, is tyre pressure monitoring. The reason I noticed was that the Everest seems to have a bit of a pull to the right. After checking the pressures at a servo and everything seeming good, I found that it was Ford's lane keep system, which positions the vehicle a little further right in the lane than I would naturally. So I'd been driving for about an hour down a freeway, tensing the wrists against the motor of the electrically assisted steering. Fail. End quote. So... Here's this miraculous software, right? Mr. Enright's either putting the car in the wrong spot or the car is failing to measure the middle of the lane. And it seems to be intervening in a situation where the car is not in danger of leaving the lane. So how excellently engineered is this software exactly? Like, optimised for human use sounds like not very optimal to me, right? And this is two stories that were published like three or four days apart about the same vehicle. Like, come on. In the Car of the Year piece, they say, quote, Everest is far more composed than Ranger through the lane change. This is a quote by the always trying to be liked by everyone, Alex Inwood, personal opinion. Go figure. Everest is more nimble than a Ranger in the lane change. I'd suggest that it's 430 millimetres shorter, of which 370 of those shorter millimetres are in the wheelbase. So that would have a profound effect, would it not, on the moment of inertia of the vehicle. The moment of inertia is how the vehicle responds to changes in rotational motion. You've got a higher moment of inertia, you need greater effort to make it change direction rotationally, okay? It's also got a coil sprung rear end with a Watts link versus the Ranger's leaf springs, so that would want to make a difference, would it not? And it's got 293 kilos less load capacity, and what that means is if you're driving a Ranger in a lane change manoeuvre on a controlled track, then that Ranger is likely to be unladen and therefore it's a long way from its maximum load capacity and certainly a long way from some sort of middle ground optimal load configuration where the handling has been, you know, notionally optimised. If you're driving an Everest unladen, there's 
less load to go to get to that maximum load configuration and that sort of optimal middle ground, median, whatever, load configuration. And therefore, for all these reasons, you could be a profoundly shit engineer and get the Everest to handle better than a Ranger. And I'd suggest that comparisons to a Ranger are really not where we should be, you know, drawing some conclusion about the handling prowess of a vehicle such as an Everest. They go on and they say, all judges agreed that six-pot engine, the six-pot engine, was the pick. However, delivering a cultured note for an oil burner at the top end and 600 newton metres on tap to tow up to three and a half tonnes braked. I'm not sure that's English, but the numbers are there. It feels as if it could drag an errant tectonic plate back into line. Now, if we just take the masturbatory language out of that, and examine this three and a half ton towing proposition, shall we? Now, nobody's going to be towing any errant tectonic plates back into place with anything, but the payload of an Everest Platinum V6 is 658 kilograms, according to Red Book, 658 for complete disambiguation, of which, if you do tow three and a half tons, about 350 kilos is going to be the tow ball download, which is going to deliver you that sort of greatest dynamic stability for the combination, okay? You're going to have to fit a tow bar because otherwise you can't tow anything, and that's going to weigh about 50 kilos, right? 350 plus 50, the download plus the weight of the bar, that's 400 kilos. And if you take 400 kilos away from the payload. And the reason you've got to do that is because the tow ball download is being carried. It's a load that's being carried by the vehicle. So therefore, it is part of the payload, and you have to do this, right? If you take that 400 kilos away, you're left with 258 kilos of remaining payload capacity. That's all the people, all the stuff in the vehicle, and any other accessories that you fit, such as a roof rack and an awning or driving lights or a bull bar, whatever, okay? I'd suggest that if you tow three and a half tons, if you put a family of five on a big trip, you go on a big holiday, and you attempt to tow three and a half tons, and if the average weight of your family of five, the average weight of a person in your family is 52 kilos, you're gonna be overloaded. So it is absolutely irresponsible not to talk about the context when it comes to this claim of Fords that you can tow three and a half tons. You can tow three and a half tons, but not in practice, not the way people actually use vehicles out on the highway every day. That's just a misrepresentative joke. And it's because the whole car industry is in a race, like an arms race, and it leads to widespread, dangerous, illegal overloading of vehicles on the highway 24-7, 365. So, what did the Everest actually beat? The cars that it beat. Audi A3 and Audi e-tron GT, the BYD Addo 3, the Cupra Formenta, the Ranger, obviously, Genesis GV60, the Nissan Qashqai X-Trail and the Z, Peugeot 308, Skoda Fabia, Range Rover, Tesla Model Y, Corolla Cross, and according to them, it beat a Toyota 86, which is actually called a GR86 now, but who's counting, and the Volvo C40. So I'm just wondering, do you think any of those might have been a better winner of car of the year? Perhaps one of those vehicles that's actually a car could have won. Who knows? Let me know in the comments. And speaking of which, we'll get to some comments on this report on the Wheels website in just a second, but I would also love to know what the advertising spend is at Wheels Media for Ford. And I'm not alleging that there's any overt corruption going on, but if this were politics, it would be mandatory to disclose, would it not? So it'd just be interesting to know if the advertising spend is zero or if Ford is one of Wheels Media's biggest advertisers. And what other things, what other freebies did they get apart from their long-term car, which is just like, hey, love us, right? 
And just to highlight the underlying irrelevance of this award, the award was announced like two days ago and there's 73 comments on the blog post detailing Everest one, you know, like 73. I remember when car of the year used to be something. I've written a thousand features for Wheels magazine in my past for my sins in previous lives, I suppose, but uh, including a whole bunch of stuff on the judging criteria and all of that fluff, you know, and I'm gobsmacked that only 73 people in two days have been motivated to comment on that. It just shows me how irrelevant that publication has become. It's just kind of like what happened to Holden, only in automotive publishing. Anyway, some of these comments. I, I got some good ones here. Frank says, what an ugly tank. If this is Wheels Car of the Year, it's no wonder I stopped buying the magazine years ago. Well, yeah, Frank, but you're still engaged enough to comment, son. So you might have to look in the mirror and inquire as to exactly why. But I agree with you about it being a square peg in a round hole, Jesus. Clive says, while this is an excellent looking and equipped car, especially the sport, do judges not take into account the many public unreliability reports and faults that are common in first builds and the tardiness with which they are dealt with by dealers and Ford for a few unlucky buyers? Easy answer there, Clive. No, they don't. They choose not to comment on things like that because motoring journalists, and I'm not talking about the dudes riding for wheels, I'm talking about motoring journalism generally around the world, far too chummy with the car industry, trying far too hard to be friends with our mates in the industry, when in fact they should be treating you as a priority, like you're the consumer, you're the audience, journalism exists for an audience of people. It doesn't exist just to keep advertisers sweet, and yet this is the perverse inversion that is in place at the moment in our market, which I find reprehensible and amazing. Go figure. Mr. Fix-It now. I like this one. This vehicle has clearly been built by people with a deep understanding of how it's going to be used by its key market. He's quoting wheels, right? He says, had to laugh. Was he referring to mums dropping kids off at school? Because that is where I see most of these large four-wheel drives. Here, fucking here, Mr. Fix it. Like, that's the operational envelope for these big shitters, is it not? And the low range, the high ground clearance, the ladder frame, the preposterously land yacht-ish dynamics on road... It's completely at odds with the actual use that the majority of these vehicles are put to. It really is. David Planet now says it's definitely a sign of the times that motoring magazines have to go backwards to remain relevant if they want to sell magazines. Everest gains what a HQ Holden gained at the start of the 70s compared to the Ranger. Rear coil springs and wins car of the year on its heavy truck chassis and all. Wow. We've advanced so much in 50 years. Lol. Hear, hear, David. Have to agree, son. Like, it's the HQ Holden all over again. Like, it really is. Same engineering underpinnings as Ranger and not a car of the year. Bruno says, seriously, this is the best you could come up with? A lardy multi-ton truck? Yeah. As a proportion of the 70-something people who commented, there's a fair old amount of criticality out there, is there not? Jason Recliner. That's probably going to be lost on a whole bunch of people in the non-English-speaking world. Says, Jeebus, really? A facelifted 2.5-tonne diesel engine ladder frame wagon is the car of the year. Righto. And AC, A-C-double-E, and presumably his sister in that duo, DC, goes, ha, 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 ha. That's not a word, AC. Anyway, he goes, ha, 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 ha. Not even April Fools. Seriously. Who's the real winner? And there were some people in the comments, to be fair, who were frankly overjoyed that any vehicle, even not a car that was not an EV, won the award. So I guess there's a bit of rosy rear vision mirror, you know, looking at the past there. But Love to know what you think about that. Is a vehicle like Everest really a starter for an award called K? 
car of the year? Or is this just another step on the continuum of wheels putting its foot up on the desk and then just having a negligent discharge every year, like clockwork? <laughs>